I'm Sam Slater from Fun Calibre, and today I've been joined by Ketan Patel, co-manager of Eden Tree Responsible and Sustainable UK Equity Fund. Hi, Ketan. Hi, guys. How are you? Very well, thank you. So, Eden Tree has been at the forefront of sustainability for more than three decades, but it's taken that long for there really to be this sudden interest now from investors in sustainable investing. What do you think's changed? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. You know, we, uh, Eden Tree, launched our first fund in 1988. And to give you some context, that was, you know, before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So we've been doing this for a very, very long uh, time. I think what's happened over that 30 year plus period is we've gone from, you know, ethical investing to uh, SRI, RI, ESG, then sustainability, and now impact and transition. So the whole land has changed. So it's actually developed uh, over that period of time. And most, you know, subsectors of the industry have to have time. But you're right, what's been the catalyst, let's say, for the last 18 months in particular? Because some of the challenges which we are seeking to address, uh, whether it's climate change, efficiency in terms of resource management, et cetera, they've been there for the last 30, 40 years. So why now? I think the pandemic uh, has been a clear uh, catalyst, not just on the E, which is, you know, when we talk about ESG, it's environmental, social and governance. The environmental factor has always been there. Um, and it's always been high profile for a very, very long time. And we've got COP26 uh, taking place in Glasgow later on this year. But the S has come to the forefront in terms of social inequality, social inequity as well. The G as well, people are now challenging, come and say, hang on, you know, it's not just about governments, it's actually corporates have to step up to the plate because they have such a huge impact through employees, uh, through suppliers, how they manage their own environmental and social impact as well. So that's come to the forefront. The other part is a generational shift as well. Uh, a new generation of investors are coming, not only at retail, but also, uh, I'd say, institutional investors, the, the second generation of high net worth uh, individuals and corporates coming through and saying, actually, we now have a responsibility uh, to step up, not just to the, to the planet, but also to people as well. So those things are now challenging. And also regulations have come through as well, you know, there is now mandate uh, uh, actual for fund managers to report on ESG uh, uh, criteria, whether it's integrated within the investment process, and also you know guidelines on how to report. Uh, we've got the UN come in as well with the SDGs, which have become prominent now because previously those were seen for governments to implement you know, the 17 goals. But actually now corporates are saying, "Hang on, what's your impact? How are you measuring it?" Uh, and that's and I think the pandemic's almost actually concertina that whole thing. And we've now got this almost perfect storm where there's a lot of capital rushing into ESG, uh, which often commentators say, is that, is that a bad thing as well? Uh, but yeah, overall pandemic and the customer base primarily has been the kind of drivers, I think, for this immense now spotlight on ESG. And you mentioned briefly there the S of the ESG. One of the key characteristics of your fund is Social responsibility is key to your investment decisions. Can you perhaps tell us a bit more about that and how you measure social responsibility and impact? That's a very difficult question uh, and has plagued many investors and commentators. So the environment, the E is straightforward to measure, you know, carbon footprint in essence. How do you want your waste, your water, the way you get your power? So you know, we run carbon footprints on all our portfolios for the last six years, and they score incredibly well against the index, which is the FTSE All Share in the case of the two funds, which I am named on in the UK. So that's a very easy measure: scope one, scope two, scope three. There's plenty of uh, you know education out there on this technology, uh, etc. To, to measure the G is straightforward because that's mandated by governments. Ultimately, you know, having a separate chair, CEO, independent board, audits, all that kind of stuff. The S has always been the hard, the hardest to measure because often it's not tangible. One of the things that we look for when we, you know, look at companies, we look at how they uh, treat their employees fundamentally. So, you know, uh, do they disclose on gender in terms of employees? Is there a pay gap? Why is it is it declining? Accident rates, health and safety, and these are are, are, are points you can measure over a period of time. See, actually, is a company taking this seriously? And one of the questions that my colleague Neville White who leads on the RI uh, for us at Eventry often says to the CEO, how many people died on in this year on your on your watch? And that's not meant to offend, it's just meant to say, is the CEO aware of what's happening? And if that person isn't, then you think, hang on, are you taking this seriously? 
The other part is in terms of how they treat their employees in terms of training, development, not just in the UK, but some of the companies that we invest in obviously operate around the world. And some of the things that you and I take for granted, uh, you know, the right to paternity, maternity leave, all that kind of stuff, sick pay, uh, uh, minimum wage, are those employed around, not just in the UK, but in also operations around the world. Also, our suppliers, a really good example here would be Tesco, uh, used to operate um, hypermarkets, as well Shanghai. They gave the same rights as they would to a UK employee to those operating in China. Now, the right to form a union in China is illegal. It's not in the UK. You know, a, a break every four hours, paternity, all the things that we take for granted, those are things we monitor. And these are easier to monitor, to, or to, to also monitor. The other part is, you know, how deeply embedded is a company within the community that it does operate in? Because some of the companies which you invest in are small and mid caps, so they're, you know, they're regionally based. Uh, like some big tracks, uh, which is a chemicals company based up in Lancashire. What is it doing in terms of local employment? You know, uh, and, and that's the kind of thing that we want to encourage and see, are you employing from your local pool? Are you then spreading your, the, your goodwill, whether in terms of products and services within the supply chain locally as well? That's much harder and deeper. That means you have to do a lot of legwork. I mean, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing over 700 companies a year. This is the whole team. That means effectively, you know, about three every single week. If you think, uh, uh, you know, the amount of trading days that we do have, but that means meeting them not only in London, going out to see uh, at, at their operations, speaking to operational staff as well, not just the CIO or the CEO. When they come in, they're in their lovely business suits with a lovely slick pat, uh, kind of patter, which sounds lovely, but actually when you go and see them in situ, that's when you get the best bit of information about, you know, how well this company run, how well are staff engaged, uh, and that has come to the forefront, uh, you know, in in the pandemic primarily because we spent eighteen months uh, that are home. Uh, we've now got to engage with our colleagues, our suppliers, management in a different way when we come out of the pandemic, which I'm hoping slowly that we will by 2022. I've got my first face to face meeting tomorrow uh, with with the client. So you know, that's, that's after eighteen months. So you know, it's it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, I think. But on the on, on the S itself, I think that the the methodology is evolving, and hopefully, the way we look at companies in super in depth, I think that should give investors a real clear steer on how engaged we are. And having a closer look at the portfolio, you don't have much in technology at the moment. Is that because there's no opportunities in that area, or do these type of companies not part of your screen? Uh, that's another good question as well. Um, so technology is a very small part of the FTSE all share. People tend to forget it's about 2.2% because the FTSE itself, you know, is very much dominated by what we'd call classic cyclical industries, the mining, gas, tobacco, beverages, all that kind of stuff, banks. The tech which is available in the UK as a key investor is about, I think, 20 companies across the whole range from large cap all the way down to micro. So... The companies I do own, the likes of Halmer, Sage, Spectris, NCC, have done extraordinarily well. So we've picked our, our tech companies extraordinarily well. The others, like sort of SoftGAN, Computer Center, FDM, Kanos, Avas, have done really well as well, especially during the pandemic, because a lot of the tech that is now being used is being pioneered and by also uh, being settled by these companies as well. So we're, we've got good exposure, uh, and we're probably overweight slightly against the index. I would then compare that to the... S&P 500, which is a 28% exposure to tech. And everyone knows the companies of the fans, which is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And you can also add Microsoft to that mix. And there's a whole second generation of companies coming through, including the one that we're now using as a conduit to speak, Zoom, Adobe, all the stuff that you and I have on our little stickers and every single tech piece that we have in our house is dominating the S&P. I mean, five companies dominated most of the performance for the last two years. So it's a very different setup in terms of index. And the index is changing in the UK in particular. You know, we had oil and gas, mining, et cetera, all the things that we don't invest in had a shocking year. And now they're coming back in many ways because as you come out of the pandemic, pent-up demand is coming through. So you are going to see, obviously, an increase uh, in use of those resources. And we've seen that come through inflation as well. I mean, there's a lot of concern that inflation is going to go 
for you know north of four uh, percent. You know, two is when we think it's it's getting racy. So at four, is it temporary or is it permanent? Will we have monetary policy changes uh, next year as well? So it'll be an interesting time um, from an economics point of view in the UK. And on top of that, you've got Brexit as well, which is which is going to unwind fully, hopefully in twenty two, twenty three. That was so interesting. Thank you. It's always fascinating to talk with you. Thank you. You're very, very kind. And if you'd like to find out more about the Eden Tree Responsible and Sustainable UK Equity Fund, please go to funcalibre.com.